take the time to try to thank a lot of folks for an effort like this. And I've named a couple, but I'd be remiss in not pointing out the tremendous amount of work that David Brown does putting this together. Amen. Those of you in the audience who have directed lectureships have some idea of what it takes. Well, how many years is it now, David? 93, yeah. It's a long time. Continues to do a tremendous work. We're so appreciative of David here. Folks, we the spring congregation is blessed. I don't know whether you know it or not, but we are. So I, I think back when, uh, I guess we're still in the brown years. We started back some years with, with Al, and some of you remember him. I, uh, I guess the first time that uh, we spoke to Al about coming to work here, he, he made it plain that he wanted to have permission to go to, I think it, at that time was two lectureships uh, a year. And uh, when he would come back, Al was really charged up. He was, he was ready to go. And uh, I pointed that out there in conversation to a couple of people this week that uh, I counted uh, uh, one of the benefits of having, or, or should I say, one of the things that we enjoy doing in hosting a lectureship is getting you preachers together, because I think it's good for you, and uh, we cherish that. But uh, I remember Al coming back and talking about various people, and he would mention a guy named Dub. Who in the world is Dub? Well, we found out who Dub was, is, continues to be. <laughs> and uh, we've uh, become friends with Dub. We've had the privilege of having him stay with us for a number of years, and we're particularly privileged this year that LaVon came. We're delighted to have her with us. Now, if you want a biography, I've got about a page here and uh, I'll be glad to email it to you. <laughs> but I'm not gonna read all of this. He's, he's worked in so many places and done so much good for the Brotherhood. Uh, we appreciate him so much. Uh, when David and I were talking about who was gonna do what, and I said, well, I'll introduce Doug. And I said, David, you come up after him. And, and uh, he said, well, are you gonna get up and stop him? And I said, no, nah, I don't know that I can stop Dub, but then it occurred to me that uh, I'll not give him any bluebell when he gets home tonight if he doesn't stop. <laughs> Fellowship is eating bluebell together. <laughs> Dub, come speak to us. I'll have to work hard to out-eat not only Buddy, but Burnell on the Bluebell, I tell you what. But we have enjoyed the Bluebell each evening. I'm so glad that LaVon could come with me this year. Uh, she has not been able to travel much with me in the last uh, few years. And so I was particularly glad that she uh, though I don't think she really felt like coming, that she forced herself to come <laughs> and uh, has been with us this year, and I know so many of you have enjoyed seeing her again. We do enjoy very much staying with uh, Buddy and Burnell and appreciate their exceptional hospitality. It's just uh, like being at home, and uh, they make us feel that way each year, and we know where everything is in the bedroom, the bathroom, and kitchen, and all the other places around there. And I'll tell you what I was surprised to see when we uh, drove up in uh, Saturday and uh, first saw their open garage, uh, number one, that he wasn't driving a Suburban. <laughs> that he defected to a Ford, but number two, he stayed in the General Motors family with a Corvette. 
kids do have their toys. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've heard of midlife crises. Now, I don't know if that's what provoked the Corvette or not, but I'm... It's too late to midlife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit jealous. <laughs> I'm a little bit jealous. It's always a joy to come to spring, and uh, been here many a year for the lectureship. Many of you came to Denton during our lectureships there, and we indeed do know what it takes out of you to uh, conduct a lectureship like this. Uh, special appreciation goes to the elders here <clears throat> for their oversight of my support funds. They've been doing this now for some six years or so, five and a half years. And Brother Ken Cohn especially for uh, uh, taking care of my support account. I appreciate that deeply and I count it a great privilege to have that sort of fellowship with you beloved brethren here. David, of course, is a dear friend of many years, and we've uh, fought many a battle together and gone many places together and uh, had a lot of fun together in places all over the world as well as here at home. And we don't get to see each other as much as I would like to see him and others of you as well. But we'll have a lot of time to catch up when we get to heaven. Four books that have been reviewed today were written by either both of the men who wrote the book I'm reviewing or one of the men who wrote this book. The title of this book is Illusions of Innocence, and it is subtitled Protestant Primitivism in America from 1630 to 1875, and the best thing about the entire book is the beautiful cover. It was written by Richard T. Hughes and C. Leonard Allen, and I need to give proper credit to Brother Jess Whitlock for making me a present of this book. I think I was in a meeting at Evant when we got our invitations from David for the lectureship, and he asked me what my book was, and lo and behold, uh, I hadn't been home very long before it arrived in the mail, compliments of Jess, and I, I appreciate that. I know Terry wishes he had had a benefactor. <laughs> <laughs> This is a paperback edition. It apparently came out in a hardback edition earlier, 1988, has uh, University of Chicago copyright, but uh, the copyright now belongs to ACU Press, and this uh, paperback uh, came from them in 2008, I believe. I'll mention a little bit about Dr. Hughes and Dr. Allen <clears throat> because uh, their backgrounds help explain some of the material that they have written. Dr. Hughes is the Boyer Fellow Distinguished Professor of Religion at Messiah College. According to their website, they are rooted in the Anabaptist, Pietist, and Wesleyan traditions of the Christian Church. Before assuming that post in Grantham, Pennsylvania, he was a distinguished professor in the religion division at Pepperdine University and directed its Center for Faith and Learning. Dr. C. Leonard Allen has held professorial posts at Biola University, which is a faith-only dispensational premillennial evangelical school that, according to its website, requires each faculty member to adhere to its doctrinal platform. He also taught at Fuller Theological Seminary, an almost uh, twin of Viola in its doctrine, requires the same doctrinal adherence of all of its faculty, and some of its faculty are heavily involved in the emerging church movement. 
And then uh, Dr. Allen taught at ACU, <clears throat> which is not far behind either of the above institutions, I fear. He is presently editorial director of Leafwood Publishers and director of ACU Press. His Leafwood advisory board includes such liberal, uh, liberal luminaries as Lynn Anderson, Max Licado, Daryl Tippins, John Allen Chalk, and Leroy Gary. Both Hughes and Allen are obviously intelligent and scholarly men, and both of them are able wordsmiths. The book is very readable. They appear to be historians who've read and researched widely, and they both bear well-earned liberal credentials. The titles of most of the books that they have either singularly authored or uh, together authored almost altogether have to do with their penchant for restoration history. Illusions of Innocence is apparently exemplary of uh, others that they have written concerning uh, those subjects. They all have the same uh, point of view toward the church, to depict it as a denomination in the larger cesspool of religion we call denominationalism. This book contains a considerable amount of American church history, which is interesting, going all the way back to the 17th century colonial times and well into the 19th century. While this history is interesting, faithful Bible exegetes cannot at all agree with the interpretations placed upon that history or the conclusions drawn from it in relation to the Lord's Church. Now I have very few quotes in my chapter in your lectureship book from this book. I wrote Brother Allen and requested permission to quote from his book because the copyright page, the verso page, said that you could not quote from it except for very brief quotations for a newspaper or magazine type of review. So he gave me permission to quote 500 words from his volume and I think I spared him a few of those words. But I believe we will get the gist of what he said. The aim of the authors is to convince the reader that men can never achieve restoration of any original entity that has been abandoned or corrupted, particularly the church, with the passing of time. The following quotation will tell the reader all he needs to know about the theological agenda of this book. Of those attracted by Alexander Campbell's plea for restoration, he wrote the, they wrote the following to confine themselves to Bible words without explanation would be to speak where the Bible speaks and to be silent where the Bible is silent, and in so doing to identify with the Christian primordium in the fullest sense possible, or so it seemed. But in accepting this seductive posture, the Christians, in quotation marks, engaged in a profound but subtle transformation that would have lasting and even devastating effects. In the first place, restoration became no longer a means to an end, that end being freedom, but rather an end in itself. At this point, it perhaps was inevitable that some would claim that the Church of Christ had fully restored the ancient order and now was the one true church outside of which there was no salvation. These claims would come in due time. It's from pages 118 and 119 in case you buy and want to read the book. To Allen and Hughes, all such efforts must ever be in process, impossible of realization. All restorers who claim their efforts as a fait accompli are doomed thereby to become that which they set out to oppose and escape, the shackles and barnacles of religious creedalism and self-righteousness. Now there is the thesis of the book. It is impossible to restore New Testament Christianity. 
The book title implies both their thesis and their conclusion. Restoration is a mere illusion, and only the innocent read naive. Attempt it or believe it is possible. The authors thus sit upon their self-erected thrones of superior knowledge and wisdom, and from elitist ivory towers of academe look with condescension on all who, based on God's word, deny both their thesis and their conclusion. To them we are simple, gullible, benighted, hoi polloi, simply striving for an unattainable goal. I will address many of my remarks to their anti-restorationism, therefore. Among the major emphases of the authors is what they take up near the beginning of their book in a study of two Puritans in the colonies. In New England, <clears throat> through the careers of John Cotton in Boston and Roger Williams, who was there for a while, they set out what they call paradigms. Cotton, even before fleeing to Boston in 18 or 1634 from church authorities in England, eschewed the ceremonies, polity, and oppression of the Church of England and vowed to follow a course of restoration of the primitive church. Failing to distinguish between the covenants, he mistakenly sought to combine civil and sacred authority, and largely after the model of the Hebrew theocracy, he set up his religion. Ignoring Cotton's several scriptural concepts, Hughes and Allen disparagingly used Cotton's restoration effort as evidence that the restoration impulse causes one to be blinded to his own finitude and leads to denying legitimacy to others, which means recognizing scriptural fellowship boundaries as Cotton sought to do. Contrarywise, they laud the approach of Roger Williams, who was Cotton's contemporary and adversary. His approach to primitivism, as they call it, or restoration, involved calls for toleration and freedom of conscience. He believed that all human attempts at reformation and religion are doomed to failure, and that Cotton, who sought reformation, was subject to errors and judgment and limitations as had been his predecessors. Hughes and Allen agree with Williams that men only naively and inflexibly claim a smug, quote, certitude in religious matters, unquote, which often becomes, quote, a cloak for self-serving ends and a justification of mistreating of others, unquote. Of course, Allen and Hughes would never arrogate such inflexible smugness to their own certitude in religious matters. All they did was write a book to convince us of the smugness of their certitude. Cotton admittedly failed to get everything right, but it does not follow that all men who pursue a course of restoration must fail to get it right. In discrediting Cotton's efforts, the writers violated a basic principle of rationality. One cannot justly employ the abuse or misapplication of a principle or entity to oppose the principle or entity itself. Such constitutes the fallacy of diversion. The principle of restoration must be judged on its actual merits rather than upon abuses or misapplications of it. Our authors obviously despise certitude in religious matters as much as Williams did, in spite of incessant scriptural emphasis upon it. They indicate their agreement with fellow liberal and Allen's former fellow professor at Abilene Christian University, Carol D. Osborne, in his brand of doctrinal certitude, as expressed in his book of several years ago, The Peaceable Kingdom. We quote Osborne, there should be room in the Christian fellowship for those who differ on whether more than one cup in communion is acceptable, 
whether the communion bread is to be pinched or snapped, whether one can eat in the church building, whether funds can be used for the church treasury to support orphan homes, whether the Lord's Supper must be taken every Sunday, or whether instrumental music is used in worship. There should be room in the Christian fellowship for those who believe that Christ is the Son of God, but who differ on eschatological theories such as premillennialism, ecclesiological matters such as congregational organization, or soteriological matters such as whether baptism is for or because of the remission of sins, unquote. Hughes, Allen, and Osborne and their associates would all have fit in well with Roger Williams had they lived in colonial times, and I almost wish they had. Hughes and Allen represent a large coterie of progressive brethren who disdain and ignore heavenly doctrinal and fellowship mandates, thereby allowing them to embrace denominational associates in their ironic ecumenism. They clearly feel far more affinity with them than with us simpletons. Outright liberals are by no means alone, however, in disdaining and disrespecting these and similar biblical injunctions. Over the past five years, we have seen hundreds whom we once counted faithful fellow workers follow the lead of such liberals in fellowship compromises. They talk about the original aims of Campbell and Stone to a considerable degree in their book. According to Hughes and Allen, the principal aim of the early 19th century restorers was not restoration at all. And we've heard that theme from some other books, even those reviewed today, I think, as if this were an unworthy ambition. But it was the pruning of human creeds and practices that burdened Protestantism and the unification of the denominations. The restoration idea developed only as a means of reaching that twofold goal they proffered. Only later, they averred, did restoration become the end rather than the means to the end. The factors that produced this new priority had, quote, lasting, even devastating effects, according to Hughes and Allen. In other words, if Campbell and Stone had just stuck with their unity and let's get rid of the creeds, they would have been all right. But when they got over in that business of restoration, they jumped the tracks. Admittedly, Alexander Campbell's writings in the 1820s <clears throat> and early 30s revealed that his expectation of the millennium involved the disavowal of sectarian creeds and names by the denominations and uniting in a purified church to preach the gospel. The resultant conversion of most of mankind would be the dominance of the Lord's law among men for a thousand years. Campbell apparently believed that through his unification effort, by means of restoration, the gospel would eventually end civil governments and the millennial rule of Christ would prevail. His flawed millennial concept furnished the name for his second periodical, the Millennial Harbinger. Let us grant that the original aims of these men were purification and unification of religion. Let us grant also that the restoration concept was originally secondary. Granting both invalidates neither the restoration aim nor principle. Those early pioneers did not abruptly recognize and depart from all of the errors that had so long bound them and generations before them. As they studied the Bible, they arrived bit by bit at the conclusions, the true conclusions regarding New Testament doctrine and practice. They were as men in the deep darkness of a cavern who only gradually see the way illuminated as they draw nearer their exit from it. We should then not be surprised that the concept of restoration as an end may not have immediately occurred to those spiritual trailblazers. Nor should it surprise us that the dual aims of purification of and unity in religion produced in these men the ideal and pursuit of restoration. After all, 
what would and still does, peeling away the many layers of unauthorized man-produced names, creeds, and practices render but restored New Testament churches. Likewise, only when congregations are content to exist apart from man-imposed dogmas can they enjoy biblical unity, as prescribed in 1 Corinthians 1.10. No divisions among you. All speak the same thing. Be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Are of the seven ones of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. The significant point is that wherever these men began in their spiritual pilgrimage, their quest led them to the noble spiritual plea to restore primitive Christianity. How can one infer anything but a restoration intent from Thomas Campbell's 1809 statement, we speak to where the Bible speaks and we are silent where the Bible is silent. I have a long section in my chapter on uh, hermeneutics and the restorers as it's treated in this book. And these men are uh, well-qualified new hermeneuticers, I guarantee you. They despise the hermeneutics that uh, really unfold the Bible and its truth for us and how it applies to us today. As one would expect, they are not big fans then of the hermeneutical principles at which the restorers so gradually and laboriously arrived in their studies. They rail against the idea of induction of Bible passages to get the right deduction of biblical truth. I thought it interesting that they inducted many historical sources to deduce that induction of scripture and correct deduction therefrom is invalid. But that's what they do. Please read my chapter for that material. Now is restoration possible? The thesis of the book, recall, is no, it is not possible. Contrary to the anti-restoration fulminations of the authors, restoration is not a mere mirage beyond man's ability to achieve. The Word of God not, not only affirms the desirability of restoration in the face of religious corruption, but the necessity of it. This divine mandate implies the possibility of restoring the purity of doctrine and practice when men have abandoned it and of maintaining the pure doctrine and practice when men have restored it. Therefore, numerous principles, statements, and our narratives in both testaments of our Bible demonstrate the verity of the foregoing assertions. Let's look at some of those. What about the function of the Mosaical Age prophets? When God gave the law through Moses, he demanded that Israel comply fully with it. Remember, he gave ten commandments, not ten suggestions. His demand implies their ability to keep them. Nearing death, Joshua warned God's people to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that you turn not aside therefrom to the right or to the left, Joshua 23, 6. They followed Joshua's charge, but only for a while before apostasy became the norm. After about five centuries, with the Babylonians at Zion's gate, God stated the following to Jeremiah. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff. They did worse than their fathers. Jeremiah 7, 25 and 26. Now for what purpose did God send prophet upon prophet to his people? Unless to call them back to his law. To admonish them to restore God's way from which they had departed. It is evident that God believed that the restoration of his people was not only desirable but it was necessary and therefore attainable in the Old Testament times. We have a case in point in King Jer uh, Josiah. 2 Kings 21 through 23 and 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. 
Josiah was one of those precious few righteous Judean kings, often called the Restorer King. Had Hughes and Allen been around when he reigned, they would doubtless have made great sport of his efforts, even as they do in our present day of us. It is not difficult to imagine the way they would have ridiculed Josiah. I can just hear them. Attack and destroy the false religions. Publicly commit yourself to obeying God's word. Clean up and repair the temple. Reinstitute the Passover? Who do you think you are to do what your fathers never attempted or accomplished? Don't you know you will be opposing almost the whole nation? Don't you see how the religions around us will ridicule us narrow and judgmental in declaring that there's only one religion? Don't you realize you cannot actually restore the true religion in Judah and that any restoration you think you accomplish will only be an illusion? Well, God delighted in the restoration Josiah wrought, including his certitude in religious matters and his mistreatment of others, especially the priests of Baal must have felt that. Well into his restoration work, the inspired writer evaluated Josiah as follows, and like unto him was there no king before him that turned to Jehovah with all his heart with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. 2 Kings 23, verse 25. Josiah's efforts wrought real restoration in Judah. Those of us who know the history of the time know that it did not last, but nonetheless he wrought a genuine, not an illusory, restoration. If true religion could be and was restored almost nine centuries after God gave the law through Moses, then true religion according to the will of Christ can also be restored centuries after his church has fallen victim to the corruptions, philosophies, and traditions of men, and God will always have it so. God is a God of patterns, and from this we know that restoration is possible. Liberals find the pattern concept embedded in scripture to be particularly irksome concerning the church, and the reason is obvious. After all, the fundamental purpose of a pattern is to provide the means to duplicate the original. Therefore, the very thesis of Hughes and Allen in Illusions of Innocence constitutes a tacit denial that God has a pattern for his church involving its entrance requirements, its worship, both acts and the day of assembly, its organization, its work, and other features of it. While they do not care about such matters, God most certainly does care because he is the ultimate patternist. And then there's the implication of individual restorations. When brethren as individuals stray from the Lord's way, is it desirable, necessary, or possible to restore such a one? Does not the call for repentance imply the call for restoration? Unless one adheres to a once an apostate, always an apostate doctrine, a peculiar twist on Calvin's perseverance of the saints error, one must give an affirmative answer to the foregoing questions. Restoring fallen brethren is desirable because it is necessary if they are to be saved, as numerous statements of the New Testament say. And because we are commanded to seek their restoration. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of gentleness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians 6, 1. It is possible, at least in some cases, as we see of the brother addressed in 2 Corinthians 5 and the demand that the church there withdraw from him, and then in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10, where Paul says, Receive this brother back who has been penitent. And then you have Galatians 6, 1 again, that we are to restore the erring brother. If one brother who strays can be restored, can two be restored to original faithfulness, not merely an illusion now. 
If two, why not 200? If all religion becomes apostate, cannot true religion be restored, even as an individual apostate brother or congregation can be restored? Then there are implications of the New Testament demands for doctrinal purity that say, yes, restoration is possible. To deny that men can take the New Testament and reproduce the New Testament church in any age is tantamount to denying that men who originally possessed the New Testament in the persons of inspired men first, then gradually in print, did so in the first century. What they did then when the apostles were upon the earth receiving that message of revelation, men can do now or 10,000 years from now if the Lord delays his return. If restoration is not possible, what is the purpose of the relentless emphasis of the plethora of passages that call men to receive, revere, and submit to the will of God as delivered through his Son? The many appeals to repent aimed at wayward saints and churches all imply the possibility of restoration. Did the Lord really mean it when he commanded Ephesus? Remember, therefore, whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I come to thee and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Revelation 2.5. Could Ephesus actually do her first works, be restored? Indeed, she could have. And then there's the seed principle, mentioned already today in one of the lessons. Jesus said, the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Luke 13, verse 10. The seed brings forth after its kind. Now, the seed doesn't always bring forth, as the parable of uh, the seed uh, and the sower tells us, because the soil is not always right. But if a seed brings forth anything, it brings forth after its kind, and its kind is always bound up in that seed. So it produces after its kind. Restoration is tied up in that. Denials such as those of Hughes and Allen of the possibility of restoration are actually rooted in a more fundamental denial in my judgment. They deny that men can arrive at an accurate understanding of New Testament truth but must ever merely be in pursuit of it. Such folks should never refer to the New Testament then as a revelation, for by implication they believe its message is so clouded in ambiguity as to be incomprehensible. To them, any who profess that they truly know or understand it are arrogant, presumptuous, and boastful, notwithstanding Jesus' clarion statement, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8:32. Not only can we know what God has commuted, uh, communicated to and through inspired men, Peter declared we can know assuredly at least some things, Acts 2 and verse 36. To deny that we can know or understand what God and his son mean in the inspired revealed message conveniently overlooks a rudimentary fact. Deity gave us the Bible that we may be able to know and understand God's mind and purpose sufficiently to be reconciled to him as a host of New Testament passages demonstrate. God certainly knows the intellectual and reasoning powers of his own creation, and he is quite capable of expressing himself in terms men can understand. The likes of brethren Hughes and Allen seemingly have a very low view of the capabilities of both God and men. It may be, on the other hand, that such liberals in the depths of their souls fully realize that men are capable of understanding the meaning of God's word and can arrive at true conclusions regarding its message and therefore restore the church. But with their denominational compadres, they have decided that God does not mean what he says. This being so, their denial that the church can be restored is merely a camouflage claim. Behind the mask, they understand the word all too well. 
their real conviction is that it just does not matter. I think that's where they are, brethren. This attitude toward truth and restoration gives such men cover for their faithless ecumenical inclinations that allows them to embrace men of every variety of name, creed, doctrine, and practice as long as they profess some sort of belief in Christ. Their mentality is well typified in the remarks of Royce Money, president of Abilene Christian University at the time he made these remarks, in the opening speech of that institution's lectureship in the year 2000. After making what at first sounded like a strong statement on the necessity of baptism, he then took it all back. Of John 3, 5, he said, I assume it's still true. If you don't know what John 3, 5, verily, verily, I'll say unto you, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He says, I assume it's all true. That's the rule. But what about the exceptions? What about countless believers whose spirituality and Christian virtues at times far outstrip mine? What about all that? I don't know, but the Lord knows exceptions, and I hope he makes a lot of them. Our job, it seems to me, is to teach the rule and let the Lord make the exceptions upon which there was loud and long applause from a large crowd of people. As all certifiable liberals so often do, Money put his brain in neutral and raced his engine in this statement, his emotional engine. I paraphrase what Money said. God is obligated to make exceptions to his teaching on baptism because there's so many spiritual believers out there who do not believe in it. Surely he will not condemn all of those good, sincere people. This is vintage denominational tripe. No, Brother Money, and all of your liberal cronies, it is not our job to teach the rule and suggest that the Lord will make exceptions. It is our job to teach the rule, period. Amen. Matthew 28, 19, 20, Mark 16, 15, 16. They claim we are arrogant if we claim to know and obey the truth and they are totally blind to their own arrogance in claiming to know that God will do what he explicitly said he will not do, namely allow those who are not born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. The New Testament contains the pattern for the church. Men in any age who love the truth can recognize that pattern and follow that pattern in essential matters relative to salvation. When several of them do so, in whatever century and whatever nation, they constitute the restored church of the apostolic age. It is not arrogant but eminently scriptural to so declare, brethren. Hughes and Olive have only piteous contempt for the simplicity of those who audaciously claim that the church has been restored and exists today in its restored state. To our liberal authors, Talbert Fanning's excellent 1845 statement represents a tragic development in restoration efforts. Here's what Fanning said. No modern system or church is of God, and he who professes to believe a system formed since the apostolic age to be so must be in great error. We claim to be members of the Church of Christ, which had its origin in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and not on Brush Run Creek in 1810, unquote. They bemoan the fact that Fanning's statement spoke for most brethren at the time, and in response they plaintively asked, quote, what had happened to the Christians, quote, unquote, in a short span of 40 years, that is, since Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell began sounding for the restoration plea. The answer is both simple and obvious. In those four decades, dedicated disciples such as Fanning had studiously applied the principles of scripture involving hermeneutics by which those earlier pioneers called for restoration and they had applied them even more fully than Stone and Campbell were willing to apply them in some cases. 
When faithfully followed, those same Bible principles will produce and maintain the same apostolic church in any age, including ours. Let us never be intimidated from heralding the grand plea of restoration, for it is the simple plea of gospel truth. It would be a wonderful day if Richard T. Hughes and C. Leonard Allen and all of their Christian Chronicle comrades would repent of their faithless folly. Short of that, we call on them to quit pretending to be part of the church they so much despise. Integrity would compel them to do what their friend Max Licato did a few years ago in shedding that albatross designation, Church of Christ. I strongly encourage them, if they must proceed in their progressive path, to follow the course of their liberal forebears who, a century ago, forced a systemic open schism between themselves and their weaker brethren, which we were in their eyes, resulting in the Christian church. This would allow them to hasten the formation of the denomination they're working so hard to make of the remnants of the restored church of the Lord Jesus. I've grown weary of the term restoration movement over the years, brethren. When I obeyed the gospel plan of salvation, the Lord didn't add me to the Stone Campbell movement. He did not add me to the Stone Campbell tradition. He did not add me to the ARM, one of their favorite designations, the American Restoration Movement. He added me to his church because he saved me from my sins in my obedient faith through his shed blood. And my friend, as we close tonight, don't you ever doubt that that same shed blood will wash away your sin. And it will do so by the very same means that it did when that gospel was first heralded on that great Pentecost day. You can be a member of that same church, not just an illusion or a mirage of it, but that same body of Christ, the Lord's people, by doing the same things the people did on Pentecost. What do we have there? We have the gospel preached in Acts chapter 2. It pricked the hearts of some of those enough that they interrupted the sermon and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? You see a tacit confession of their faith in the Christ that Peter and the eleven had been preaching. Peter did not say, well, you already believe in Christ. That's all you need to do. Just pick out your denomination and have at it. Oh, he was just a poor old Galilean, naive, simpleton, apostle of Jesus Christ. And he said, repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he kept on preaching. The promise is unto you and to your children, to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. With many other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Can we do that today? Certainly we can do that today. And the response, verse 41 of that chapter says, They then that received or gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. To what were they added? Verse 47, the Lord added to the American Restoration Movement. Those that were saved every day, no, no, not at all. He added them to his church. I submit to you, if the Lord delays his coming, ten millenniums, those same words will bring about the same result, and those who are added to that church compose the restored New Testament church in whatever age. Of course restoration is possible because the Lord necessitates it when his people go astray. Are there those here tonight who have not obeyed that same Jerusalem Pentecost gospel? If you haven't, my friend, you're not a part of that church to which they were added. You're not a part of the church that Jesus built 
I'm not a part of the church of Christ. I'm not ashamed of that term, brethren. We dare not become ashamed of it. It is eminently scriptural and authorized. To those who may be listening on the internet, my friends, if you have not done these things, you are lost in your sins, and you need, as soon as you possibly can, to find one who can baptize you scripturally into Christ for forgiveness of your sins find a congregation of the Lord's people with which to worship. Are there those here who have fallen away and need to be, dare I say it, restored? Need to repent of your sins and come back? You can be restored just as his church can be restored. If you'll come back with a prayer of confession and with a heart of penitence and the Lord will graciously forgive. While we stand and sing, we urge you to come. great debt of gratitude to McLeish. I think that sermon sure finished up this lectureship just very well. We're thankful for your presence, but above all, to allow this lectureship to be. And wherever we go from here to continue the work of the Lord, to allow that work to go on, above all, we owe thanks to God. I hope that we will never cease to count our many blessings. As the song says, name them one by one and see what God has done. While we're in the midst of a tremendous apostasy, the Bible hasn't changed. The gospel still the power to save. No matter what people say in denial, the New Testament is still an infallible blueprint, a divine pattern. And thus we cling to it because, as Peter said a long time ago, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. And we believe and assure that thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And as sure as I am of that, I'm sure the church that is of, by, and for Jesus Christ, of the glory of God the Father, and the salvation of the souls of men is on this earth. And I know I'm a member of it. You can say I'm not all you want to. You can say it's not here all you want to. And I'm simply going to go ahead and know what anybody can know if they want to know it. That's what the Bible teaches about the church. I know I've obeyed the gospel. I have enough faith in God to know he added me to the church. And I'm in the church. And I'm a child of God this evening. And I know not everybody is a member. I wish they were. And to that end, many of us labor regularly. So we're so thankful, all of you who put such great effort into this in exposing the errors in all of these books. Hopefully we'll be able to disseminate this material to a great many people. So as we thank God, our Heavenly Father, for his love for us and for the truth that sets us free, the truth that we preach, the truth that we defend, then we want to go forth with a renewed determination keep up the great work of faith. You're so thankful to the spring elders. I, words just simply uh, fail me as far as my work here over these 18 years. And that's how long we've been having this lectureship. The first year we didn't have a book, but after that we have. And these men are dedicated to the truth and want the truth of the gospel to be that which governs this congregation. And I thank God for them and my prayers are for them. 